what is light therapy? It's the application of low levels of light within certain parameters for therapeutic purposes. And studies have shown that this type of therapy can stimulate cells for higher function, healing, and tissue repair. And the beauty of this is that it's non-invasive. And this isn't new news. I mean, we've known that uh, you know you need sunlight and certain wavelengths of light to activate the active form of vitamin D. Uh, it's been used in uh, neonatal care to treat jaundice, and it affects sleep. So obviously, the exposure to light affects uh, our circadian rhythm. So a number of therapeutic benefits of light. And if we dig deeper, the biological effects of this is, you know, the mitochondria are kind of like the chromophores of plant cells. They absorb light. They produce ATP or cellular energy. But these photons can also initiate cell signaling, improve blood flow, help resolve inflammation, accelerate healing. And really what I'm going to share with you is how it releases nitric oxide. But again, the challenge of this is if you don't have enough nitric oxide being produced, then there's very little photolabile stores to be released by light therapy. So really the, the message I want to bring home is that if you restore the production of nitric oxide and titrate up an individual patient's nitric oxide levels prior to the initiation of light therapy, you're going to see amazing uh, therapeutic effects. So how's light therapy typically been used? Um, it's been used for decades on wound healing and tissue repair, for the mediation of pain, inflammation, and edema, radiation-induced dermatitis. You can use certain light therapies um, to calm the inflammation, lymphedema, oral mucositis, dermatology, skin rejuvenation, jaundice, and even seasonal affective disorder, especially people who live high up in the northern uh, hemisphere, the Scandinavian countries. You know, they're not exposed to a lot of sunlight year round. And so develop seasonal affective disorders, that the science is clear that you can mediate this through exposure of certain wavelengths of light. So where's it going? Um, you know, there's a lot of cool data coming out in traumatic brain injury. Alzheimer's obviously is a blood flow problem when you don't get enough blood flow to the brain, you don't get the nutrients to the cells, the cells die, uh, they build up the waste product, that's the beta amyloid plaque and the tangles. Uh, so it's all about blood flow. Parkinson's disease, depression, anxiety, PTSD, cardiovascular issues, and high blood pressure. Clear evidence now that exposure to certain wavelengths of light, even sunlight, can lower blood pressure. Pre-treatment for exercise-induced muscle fatigue, post-exercise recovery, and for the purpose of this audience, diabetic neuropathy. So what are the cellular processes affected by light? Uh, it increases ATP by Improving mitochondrial uh, production, the efficiency of ATP production, it releases nitric oxide. The consequences of that is you have a reduction in oxidative stress, less inflammation, and when you mediate those, you improve blood circulation. And again, every single human chronic disease is characterized by low blood flow, low oxygen, and low pH. If you increase nitric oxide, increase mitochondrial ATP production, you basically improve circulation, improve energy production, and improve oxygen and nutrient delivery to every cell in the body. So how does this work? These are the mitochondria, the, the energy production organelles of the cell. Um, lights absorbed, uh, activate cytochrome C oxidase, it's like electron transfer, and that's where you get the reduction of molecular oxygen, ATP production, uh, and that's the cellular currency of energy that every cell in the body needs. And the results of that are you basically activate a number of cell signaling pathways. This is both from nuclear transcription factors to get an increased expression of, you know, whether it's um, antioxidant response elements, growth factors, antioxidants, and inflammatory mediators. So again, this uh, sequela of events is very well elucidated on how light therapy works. But what's in probably the past uh, 10 or 15 years, it's really become almost not quite mainstream, but certainly gaining some acceptance because of the benefits of light therapy being traced back to the release of nitric oxide. So nitric oxide, for those of you that don't know, is a vasodilator, meaning that it dilates the blood vessels, relaxes the smooth muscle, and basically you get an increase in blood flow and oxygen delivery throughout the entire vascular tree. The other thing is that if you produce nitric oxide, you produce you reduce oxidative stress, reduce inflammation. So nitric oxide is a molecule. It's produced in every cell in the body. 
maintains a number of uh, issues in the cardiovascular system, um, regulates blood pressure, regulates blood flow to every tissue in the body. It, it's a molecule in the periphery that um, uh, controls gut motility. It's how our own stem cells get the signal to uh, mobilize and differentiate. So it's critically important in regenerative medicine. It's a neurotransmitter in the central nervous system, controls cell cycle. It's a bronchodilator, meaning it can reduce pulmonary pressures and mediate the effects of asthma. And it's the molecule responsible for erections in both men and women. And especially over the past two years, we've learned the importance of nitric oxide in our own immune, immune system, where it's nitric oxide that mobilizes and goes to the site of infection, whether it's a virus or a bacterium, and prevents virus from replicating, shuts down bacterial respiration. But it's even more than that. It's actually what controls oxygen delivery to the periphery. So without nitric oxide bound to hemoglobin, you cannot get oxygen delivery to the periphery. And this is part of the signaling aspects of nitric oxide. So it's much more than a vasodilator. Without nitric oxide, you can put people on 100% oxygen, but you cannot deliver that oxygen until you restore nitric oxide production. This molecule was so important that a Nobel Prize was awarded for its discovery in 1998 to Bob Fritschkopf, Lou Ignaro, and Fred Murad, specifically for their discoveries concerning nitric oxide as a signaling molecule in the cardiovascular system. And I'm just going to go back to kind of the basics because I'd like to take you back to the basics. And we know that every chronic disease, including cardiovascular disease, the number one killer of men and women worldwide, is due to an occlusion of the blood vessel, a deposition of fat, and then that plaque under the lining of the blood vessels becomes unstable, the plaque ruptures, and that's a heart attack or stroke. So this all occurs secondary to the loss of nitric oxide production. So the functional loss of nitric oxide production precedes the structural changes by many, many decades. So the ability to produce nitric oxide predicts whether or not you're going to get cardiovascular disease and become a statistic and die of heart attack or stroke. This is how it's designed to work. So this would be the lumen of the blood vessel at the top, the smooth muscle that surrounds blood vessels on the bottom. Whether When we generate nitric oxide, and whether that's through light therapy or other agonists such as sheer stress, that tells this enzyme to turn on to make nitric oxide. It binds to an enzyme called guanylocyclase, where it converts GTP into cyclic GMP, and that's responsible for smooth muscle relaxation. But this is the site of action of drugs like Viagra, or Cialis, and Levitra. They prevent the breakdown of cyclic GMP. So if you don't have enough nitric oxide produced here because you're deficient or you have endothelial dysfunction, then PD-5 inhibitors don't work. And in fact, they don't work in 50% of the men in which they're prescribed. So if you can restore production of nitric oxide or release nitric oxide through light therapy, then you can improve this whole signaling cascade and improve erections in both men and women. And then back in the 1950s, there was this concept of photorelaxation. And this was worked by Bob Furchcott, um, didn't wasn't responsible for the Nobel Prize, but he made some very important discoveries before. And so this, these are isolated blood vessels that if you can pre-contract them and then you uh, expose them to certain wavelengths of light, you get this transient vasorelaxation. But if you pre-treat with nitric oxide and you expose them to that same wavelength of light, you can potentiate that vasorelaxation effect. And so this is the whole point I wanna make here. If you're using light therapy, you have to use nitric oxide in your clinical practice because rather than getting this little bit here, you can see you get almost 10 times the amount of vasorelaxation from the same wavelength of light from the same time of exposure if you pre-treat these patients and titrate up their nitric oxide levels. Mechanistically, this is how it works. I just showed you the signaling cascade, but there are certain wavelengths of light, far infrared, infrared, and then UV, different mechanisms of action, but the end result is the same. They release nitric oxide. So there's two ways the body makes nitric oxide. One is through the enzyme called nitric oxide synthase. The other is through the nitrate, nitrite, nitric oxide pathway, which we can uh, titrate up through uh, standardized nitrate production, uh, nitrate capsules. But really, it, you can, one can compensate for the other, but when you lose the ability to make nitric oxide from both, that's when bad things start to happen. The older we get, the less nitric oxide we make through the NOS enzyme. 
So to compensate for this loss, we have to nitrate up our nitrate consumption. But I don't have time to show you in this slide that the food we eat in uh, all across the globe is deficient in nitrate. So the demands of increasing food production for a growing uh, global population has led to a reduced nutrient of nutrient accumulation, less nitrate, less nutrients across the board. So you have to standardize and you have to supplement the nitrate in your diet. Just like most Americans are deficient in magnesium and selenium and iodine, we have to supplement those. Americans are deficient in nitrate. We have to supplement nitrate in the diet. What are the consequences of nitric oxide insufficiency? Um, basically the list goes on and on, but it's high blood pressure, erectile dysfunction, Alzheimer's. Every single chronic major human disease today is due to a lack of nitric oxide production.